Hi, Gershon Wolf here and welcome to Modern Music Composition. So today I'm going to start talking about chords and I'm going to keep the discussion uh, in the realms of tonality, but I am going to introduce a little set theory later on just because that's how I like to teach things uh, in terms of atonal music. Certainly we learn everything tonal first and understand that really well and then we can get into atonal music. So each lesson, I kind of bring in some kind of aspect of, of atonal theory. Um, I got a kind of a cryptic chart here, so let me explain it. It's all about intervals. I just can't stress enough how important intervals are in music. You really got to understand which intervals are dissonant, which intervals are consonant, and even within the consonant intervals, which ones are perfect, which ones are imperfect, and then actually dissonant intervals, you could consider it, there's a school of thought that says, well, they're imperfect too. Um, they're just really imperfect. <laughs> they, they have a degree of dissonance associated with them. So I've written it out in a way that sort of keeps copacetic with the idea of the interval class vector that we talked about before that describes all the different intervals in, in terms of... Um, it's sort of an inventory of all the intervals for a set of notes. So that's why I've, I didn't uh, go from 0 to um, 11 um, because I want to show you how I would classify things going from 0 to 6 and keeping the idea of that interval class vector. So next to the uh, number of semitones, I've got a C or a D. Well, lo and behold, what does that stand for? That stands for whether the interval is consonant or dissonant. Um, then next to it, I've got the nomenclature for the interval. Uh, U means unison. M the lowercase m is a minor, the uppercase is a major, so we'll just go through it. Minor second, major second, minor third, major third, perfect fourth, and then the tritone. And the perfect fourth is five semitones. Then I, I write its inversion next to it. Um, uh, the inversion of a minor second is a major seventh. Likewise, for a major second, it's a minor seventh. Major third, I'm sorry, minor third, major sixth, major third, minor sixth, and so on. And then in blue, I've written out the interval um, for that um, inversion. So a major seventh has an uh, uh, 11 semitones, a minor seventh has 10 semitones spanning the distance between the two notes, a major six, nine, minor six, eight, perfect fifth, seventh, tritone six, the tritone is symmetric. I've written out our handy dandy eye chart down here. <laughs> um, I always keep that in my mind. That's actually how I kind of, when I, when I look at a chord and I, and I look at different um, notes, I can immediately calculate its interval by just picturing this uh, circle of um, uh, this, this chromatic uh, scale um, weaved into a circle and I can just get it right away. So I want to explain that all, well, all major uh, triads and all minor triads are consonant and it doesn't matter if they're inverted, their first inversion or second inversion. And I just want to go into some excruciating detail and show you that that's the case. Um, oh, one last thing here. The ratios that are blocked out in these um, red squares, that's what's considered a perfect consonance. It, historically, what that means is that any ratio that started with the number of, of four or less is considered perfect. Um, it, minor thirds and major thirds are also consonant, but they're not considered perfect. They're, they're called imperfect. This nomenclature becomes important when you start talking about counterpoint. There's different types of motion in counterpoint. We're not going to get into it today, but just keep it in mind that in counterpoint there are some pretty strict rules one has to follow in terms of when, of what interval you have and how you can, uh, what, how, what the rules are in writing the next note or the next interval down um, 
We'll get into that later. So let's talk about a, a major um, triad here. So our favorite CEG example. Um, written out in its form, you've got a major third and a minor third. And then spanning from C to G, you've got a perfect fifth. Now remember, we calculated that this was part of set 311. Just keep that in mind. Set class 311. Um, now let's invert this triad. First inversion, E, G, C. I've just taken the C and I pop it right over here. I just permutate it right over to the, next to the G. Well, it changes things up a little bit, not a lot. I've got a minor third left over between that interval. And then I've got a perfect fourth and a minor six. Well, they're all consonant. So, um, <laughs> got it? <laughs> uh, then, then let's do our second inversion where I just now take the G and, I'm sorry, the E and pop it over next to the C. I've got G, C, E. I've got this interval preserved, P4, which is our perfect fourth. And the interval between C and E is, is, is four, and that gives us a, a major um, third. And then between G and E, I've got a major sixth, all consonant. All these intervals, whether they're perfect or imperfect, are consonant. So there you have it. Um, that's how you calculate whether or not a chord uh, has associated with it pure consonants or if there's dissonance in it. Now, turns out that chords don't get dissonant until you add a fourth note. And that's a seventh chord. So actually, let's go over that real briefly. Um, and understand why. Understand why that's the case. Well, here's our triad, and all I've done now is add a fourth note, B. Well, it perturbs the system quite a bit when you do that. So um, the interval here, there are different seventh uh, chords. This happens to be called a major seventh chord. We'll call this major seventh. We've got our interval here between C and E, which is four three, and then four. Just real briefly, I'll mention this, that if I were to take and instead of use a B, I use an, uh, an A sharp or B flat, and that interval goes to a three, that becomes a dominant seventh. And that's a real important chord to know. But um, just keep that in mind. We're gonna go continue on with our example here. Um, now I've introduced C, E, G, B. Well, let's go through some of the motions here. Um, between E and B, what do we have between E and B? Well, we've got um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we have a perfect fifth. Well, what do we have between C of course, I left it till last, right? <laughs> what do we have between C and B? Oh, look. It's either a minor, se minor second or a major seventh. Well, in just keeping with motion forward and onward and upward, we'll call this a major seventh. Okay, there's your dissonance. You've now introduced a minor second, however you want to look at it, or a major seventh into the equation here. That's why seventh chords are so important and so cool because um, like I was saying in the, in, the, in the previous video, you don't want to perturb the system too much, but you want to give it some perturbation, give it a little bit of a punch. And that's what makes music interesting. Well, um, this certainly is interesting. I've introduced now one interval that um, is dissonant and it changes the whole scheme. And you can hear it, whether you're playing uh, piano, guitar, flute, violin, it doesn't matter. You are going to hear um, that major seventh. And it becomes important in voice leading. It becomes important in progressions. Um, it, it's, it, we'll go into it in detail.
What are we going to do next? Well, why don't we calculate which set class it's in? Let's do that. Okay. Now I'm just going to write it up here. C, E, G, B, I know, tedious, I know. <laughs> um, C, C sharp, D, Okay, so we've got, um, use a different color, I'll use blue. We've got a C, we've got an E, we have a G, and there's our B. The bad boy B. <laughs> All right, well, what do we do? We want to put it in normal form, right? And we want to go counterclockwise starting at some point and traversing around this circle in a way in which we map out the shortest distance. Well, we're just going to cut to the chase here and I can see it right now. We're going to take it like this. So we've got 11. zero, four, and seven. Now, I like to just transpose up so that our first one starts with zero because I always like to think that way. So let's just go up one, 11 to 12, and that 12 is the equivalent to zero, right, in, in mod, modular 12 um, arithmetic. So um, we've got a zero, a one, a five, and an eight. Is that correct? I went up one, 12, zero to one, four to five, seven to eight. Okay, well, I'm gonna put that off to the side here, zero, one, five, eight. Remember that. All right, I'll remember it, zero, one, five, eight. Okay, well, are we for sure that that is in, in our prime? Well, to be sure, we need to take the inverse of what we've just done and then put it in a normal form and see which one is most compactly um, uh, arranged uh, from, from left to right. So let's just do that again. And this time, because we're getting so used to this stuff. C stays C. Um, B gets inverted over here, so that becomes a one. Um, G becomes a five. And a B, C, E becomes an eight. Well, <laughs> There you have it. Zero, one, five, eight. Turns out when they're the same, you know that that's the prime form. So zero, one, five, eight is our prime form. And that is set class. 420, 0, 1, 5, 8. So, as you can see, the more and more I calculate these set classes, the easier it becomes. 
um, the more in tune you get to calculating these things. Obviously, when the sequence gets larger, things get a little bit more complicated, but lucky for us, we have a table to look at, which I haven't shown you yet, but this table exists of all 208 um, set classes. Um, but the main point I wanted to drive home are these intervals and the fact that a uh, triad, regardless if it's in uh, first version, first inversion, second inversion, or just its regular form, is all consonant. Um, we didn't go through all the inversions with respect to the um, seventh chord. We'll do that on the next video. But I just wanted to introduce you to introduce you to the fact that the seventh chord is the first chord that introduces the dissonant interval. Important to remember. Thanks a lot. That's it. And we'll see you later.